Wondering how ETFs can fit into your portfolio? Join us for our Fall into ETF Investing event, a four-part YouTube series premiering on October 18th, 2024, designed specifically for DIY investors. Check out these exciting weekly events we curated specifically for you, the DIY investor. Our special guest speakers and insightful industry experts will provide the information and education you need to gain confidence and empower you to manage your portfolios. You won't want to miss these weekly specials. Hey everybody, it's Larry Berman here. Um, again, another spectacular week. Uh, fifth week in a row, the S&P 500 was up this year and that ties for the best um, period of, of market returns uh, in 2024. And so there's been other extended periods, but week after week after week of, of gains. And it, it's it's actually quite remarkable. Um, I was out at dinner the other night uh, with uh, some American friends and we were talking about the US election. The, the polls changed quite dramatically, the betting polls this week to 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 expect that maybe Trump is now going to be in the White House. And if you look at what it means if there's a GOP sweep, I believe that that, in my mind, is possibly the worst possible outcome in the long run for the U.S. economy, but perhaps in the short run, um, what the market is kind of looking at in the last week or two with this latest breakout uh, in the markets. But as we start earnings period here this week, um, I want to look at some key sy systemic companies uh, that matter um, and and just have a look at what they've said and, and what their earnings are, are telling us. Let's take a dive into the chart room and have a look. Going to start this week uh, with a look at the bond market and what's priced in to, to markets uh, in the um, short run and in the long run. So the long run being, you know, the next year. And, you know, where we were uh, only weeks ago in terms of what was priced in and to where we are now, the market is clearly walking back uh, based on Fed uh, speaker rhetoric uh, this week. Uh, in terms of rate cuts, in, in terms of the inflation data, in terms of everything, you know, data points that we've caught. The only big weekly surprise this week was a significant uptick in initial claims. And I think the market looked past that and wants to see, you know, a couple of weeks or, or, or four weeks or a month or so of, of a rise in claims before it really starts to worry about it. Um, at this point, market doesn't seem to care at all about the outcome of the U.S. election um, and geopolitics, given the persistent bid you know we are seeing. But in Canada, you know, a bit of a different story. So, you know, in the next two meetings here, it still looks like we're we're getting more aggressive rate cuts, you know, priced into Canada. Uh, well, who's already well ahead of the Fed. Um, although through, you know, most of next year, it's about the same, but more aggressive rate cutting up front in Canada seems to be the message. And one of the reasons why the Canadian dollar in the last couple of weeks has really, you know, gone into the uh, crapper again. I had every expectation that the Canadian dollar would be biased towards weakness, um, you know, into the end of the year and into 2025. 139, 140, 142 are all sort of reasonable targets as to where the Canadian dollar bottoms out um, relative to the U.S. dollar um, before the Fed might have to cut more aggressively with a harder landing scenario in the state. So right now, harder landing scenario in Canada than, than in the U.S., given uh, the most recent data points. When we look at the U.S. long bond, again, we, we saw a pretty significant move higher in yield. This week, the 10-year and 30-year auctions were soft demand at best and, and sloppy uh, based on you know, pricing at, at the auction deadlines. Um, and the bond, bond yield, longer bond yields keep pushing higher. So inflation risk um, 
a real challenge with uh, fiscal and supply. If we get a sweep in the White House on the Republican ticket, Trump is promising to cut taxes to get elected on everything. Like, it's just unaffordable. So whether Congress would actually let him do that or not is a different matter. But if if the United States uh, population gives the Trump a mandate and gives them control of Congress fully and the White House. Again, to me, that's the more uncertain, volatile outcome because uh, I think while good for defending America and other things, perhaps, I, I'm not so sure uh, policy this time around is something the market should be celebrating compared to Trump election in 2016. Um, that ignited tax cuts and really got that going. And, and maybe that's what is behind the bond market ra- uh, rising here and the persistent bid in the stock market that we've seen, um, you know, in the last few weeks. I'm showing here a weekly chart of the S&P 500, and it doesn't look like much on this scale, but you have five up weeks in a row as marginal as they may be. And you could say, oh, Larry, but early in the year, you got this massive rally. And yeah, there there, there weren't weeks here necessarily where more than five in a row where we were up before there was a flat or a down week. And you can kind of see that. But that, that's not really the point here. There was nobody, strategist, anybody at all at the beginning of the year who had an S&P 500 target of 6,000. I think the most bullish strategist at the start of the year might have been 5,300. I'd have to kind of go back and and recheck some of my notes from back then to to be sure. But it seems like every strategist is now falling all over themselves to upgrade their S&P 500 target. So as, as earnings period starts and we get to hear from you know, Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan and, and Bank of America today and uh, sorry, not Bank of America. Well, Wells Fargo um, and, and to see the more positive response to to earnings there. And and, uh, you know, it, it just. Again, I, I'm a I'm a kind of investor who can't chase strength and momentum. I, I just have this value bias to me. And, and I struggle when markets get stupid. So Friday, uh, a company, great company named Fastenal uh, reported. And so Fastenal is a company that sells 30,000 different products and widgets. That has everything to do with manufacturing and home building and, and, and chainsaws and bandsaws and, and you name it. Um, and it's a great, great company. But this is when you think of, you know, growth and and industrial um, product, rental and and manufacturing. Why is a company like this that has a pretty modest growth growth profile trading at 38 times forward earnings when when you look at the revenue growth 2021, like, you know, 10% growth. Okay, we got a little bit of a, a recovery COVID bump, but it's now come back to earth. And and so earnings growth, like it, it's not, there, there's not, a, this is not a growth company. Why is it trading at 38 times earnings? This is much more of a value play. Yes, it's growing, but I, it just blows my mind what investors are willing to pay for companies. And so here's the stock over the last five years, ticker fast, SPX index industrials. It's outperformed the S&P 500 and the industrial complex. And it was up 9.8%, I think, on, on Friday. So I just sit here scratching my head, wondering what, you know, like like caught some upgrades on Friday. 
but not really, right? Um, so w when you look at um, analyst expectations uh, 12 months forward and what the price target is, so we got some upgrades. So the analyst forecast went up, uh, but they're looking at $68 and where value is a year from now. Um and yet this stock persistently trades well above what analysts think it's worth. And I asked the fundamental question, why? Is there, are there just no great competitors? Is it something unique that this company does? I just scratch my head, you know? And, and so I don't wanna focus on the chart here because it's not really the, the point of, of my message. It's It's, you know, the market environment that we're in, um, it, it's, you know, what Jamie Diamond said a few weeks ago about net interest margins not being there. They report earnings, you know, stock is up. What was JP Morgan up today? I'm just looking at my ticker. I, I don't see it jump off the page to me. Um, but but it's it's that, what are people paying for stuff? And and where's the earnings coming from and the growth? And when you, when you hear the strategists talk about it, they say the earnings are coming, the market's growing. As long as we don't get that end of business cycle recession and there's a perfect landing, the markets are just going to keep grinding higher. And sad to say, you know, I'm not grinding higher with it because as I've mentioned earlier this year on the last big bump, uh, in the first part of the year, I rotated all of my public uh, market risk and exposure into privates. And I'm, I'm still clipping a great coupon and I'm showing growth in my portfolio and I'm really happy about it. But, you know, paying multiples like this for even really good companies, but th that don't have, you know, massive growth profiles, it just leaves me scratching my head, folks. Anyways, you know, long weekend coming up. Uh, have a great Thanksgiving, everybody. Um, for those celebrating um, the Jewish New Year, uh, have a easy fast. And, uh, you know, uh, there's no BNN show this week because of the holiday Monday. And we'll see you in a couple weeks. And uh, just wish everybody, as we get into holiday season here, the healthy and happiness with your family and, and friends. Uh, despite my... Uh, ripping my hair out here at the at the markets kind of grinding in my face. Have a good one, everyone.